Welcome to the Maine Science Podcast. I'm Kate Dickerson. Today's episode is a conversation I recorded with Lucy Benedict in January 2022. Lucy is an Associate Professor of Chemistry and Director of the Quality Control Collaboratory at the University of Southern Maine. Her path to analytical chemistry, which we will dive into, was not necessarily cut and dried, and her work now is a great example that sometimes the work in science finds you. Lucy will be part of the 2022 Maine Science Festival at our Science on Tap session the evening of March 17th. Full details of that event and the other upcoming Maine Science Festival events can be found on our website, www.mainesciencefestival.org. I really enjoyed talking with Lucy and hope you enjoy our conversation as well. Lucy, welcome to the Maine Science Podcast. I am delighted to have you here. You and I met many years ago, actually, when I randomly, I think, called you up and said, I need you, I would really love for you to talk about your work in beer and analytics to this group of people who have no idea what's coming or something along yes. those lines. Um, so we will get into the beer and the analytics, which is an interesting gateway, I think, for a lot of people into thinking about chemistry and how it's all around us. Um, but before we do that, I was, I was hoping that you could tell us how you got into science. I noticed that you went to SUNY Oneonta and then Rensselaer Polytechnic which is where I went for my undergrad and graduate as well. So I, I'm going to hazard a guess that you may have also grown up in upstate New York, but please feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. No, you're totally right. I grew up in upstate New York, a very small town called Sydney. And uh, yeah, then moved. I, I did a brief little stint in Pennsylvania for my freshman year and uh, then went to SUNY Oneonta. So then upstate until we moved to Maine. So that was really my first time for a long period of time out of state, which has been nice. So my journey uh, in the science, it's very unexpected. I always tell my students this, especially my my Gen Chem students, because I think they have this picture that I just knew I wanted to be a chemist my whole life, and this is my dream job. It is my dream job, but uh, not a dream I had uh, originally. So when I was in high school, I always tell them the story. When I took chemistry, we had regents exams in New York, I passed by one point that regents exam. And I remember my chemistry teacher calling me at the end of the year, letting me know that I had just passed by one point, which means I passed the whole course by one point. And it was, I was never going to touch chemistry again, done with it. But I had this passion for the environment that I really just, you know, this was a time when Aaron Brockovich was big and you know, that whole like activism for the environment and, and pollution and, and human rights. So I was really interested in that. I was interested in law. I was interested in understanding these pollutants in our environment and basically how can I save the world from them? There's got to be a way to get rid of them and not let them happen again. And so I took this brief stint in Pennsylvania for my freshman year to a liberal arts school and that did not work out well. Um, and I was trying to figure out what to do. And so I just kind of ended up at my, you know, state college right up the road from my home and was touring right before the semester had started my sophomore year. And I ran into, happened to meet um, Dr. Harry Pence, who was a chemistry professor there. And he taught environmental health science and environmental um, chemistry there. And we got talking about what I wanted to do. And he says, you know, if you really want to understand these chemicals in our environment, you should major in chemistry. And then you can go to grad school and you can really explore them. And I was just like, okay, I'll do it. I didn't really quite know where I was going to go. So I figured, well, that sounds like a good idea. And I guess I'd had enough time between high school and my college career time that I was willing to give it another go and just never stopped from there. And in that process, one of the, I think one of the most transformative times for me was towards my, my junior and senior year when I got to do uh, research, undergrad research. That was really, that like opened up the world of chemistry to me and really showed me that analytical chemistry was where I wanted to go. Um, then I went on to grad school. I think it's really interesting that pop culture helped inspire what you wanted to do with your life. <laughs> and, uh, and you actually made the connection between pollutants and eventually chemistry and science. I found when I was doing chemistry that the general classes were actually harder. So I'm thinking maybe, maybe that's why the regents exam was and, and high school chemistry was so hard because you go, 
you do this broad sweep without any depth. You know, I remember vividly being in a class, must have been junior year, it was a lab, and it was explaining some physical chemistry thing. And I remember thinking, oh, this is what they were trying to explain in general chem. Like, it took two years before I could connect the dots. And it was super frustrating and also really cool at the same time. It was kind of one of those things that I, I did better in chemistry as it got more what people would call complicated. But I think it's because it made more <laughs> sense. I see that with my <laughs> students all the time. I really do. I think that's, that's a lot of people's path in the major. Yeah, I think I actually think if, if there was some way, and I don't think there's any way to do this, if there's some way to to almost skip general chem, which of course you can't because you, you need to be introduced to all this stuff, but it's almost like slog through it, really, and then and then just try something else that's based on that a little bit and it'll all be better. And, you know, I try to tell people that, but I don't know. I don't know if you find this. We're going to really go on a diversion here. My husband is a physicist and I'm a chemist and he always gets the, well, I'm not a chemist. I used to be a chemist. He always got, gets the whole like, ooh, physics. Like, ooh, super. And I would, I always get, ooh, chemistry. Why would you do that? Right? Like there's this visceral reaction mm -hmm. against chem. You get that too? All the time. Yeah. yeah. I, I, like the least popular person at a party when people <laughs> ask what I do. I'm like, well, I teach chemistry. I actually teach the gen chem course. Uh, and so, and then you hear the stories of, it's always, a, almost always a horror story, right? Of like, I had that in high school. I had that in college. I didn't, I'm just not good at that. And it's, it's not what it should be like. It can be different. It is hard. There are some cool programs out there that have eliminated general chemistry and they just start right in with organic and analytical and they teach the, ba the very basics right in those courses along with the higher level stuff. So, that's kind of a cool model. It's really hard to create. I would imagine it's really hard to do. And you have to just have the full commitment of knowing that students are going to struggle from the get-go. Yeah. All students are going to struggle as opposed to maybe just a few. Your research experience, was it in what is analytical chemistry or was it just a, a general overview? Was it, was it directly related to classes you had taken? Your undergrad experience, was it like, were you able to connect dots and or inspire yourself for the future with, with your research project? Yeah, when I was an undergrad and I did research, uh, it was very analytical focused. So that research was trying to develop a method to measure cocaine and methamphetamines in urine quickly using chromatography. And it actually uses a really cool uh, method that we use now in my lab studying beer, which is solid phase micro extraction, which is really great for pulling compounds out of different substances, whether it be urine or beer or blood or water, and concentrating them, and then you can measure them using gas chromatography. So I, that was just so cool to me that you could develop new methods of detection for compounds, and that inspired me to go to graduate school to really devote some time to doing research. That was something I really liked. I don't think without that experience, I would have gone to grad school. So that leads into uh, a question or a topical area that I'm going to ask you to describe a little bit more. We talked about this really briefly before we started actually <laughs> recording here. Analytical chemistry, which for people who don't have a chemistry degree, you take loads and loads of chemistry classes of all different kinds, and they all they all have some area, right? There's organic, there's inorganic, there's physical. And analytical always struck me as a black box, both for chemists and for <laughs> others, in that what is it really? So you just said, you know, you developed a whole new methodology for figuring out the methamphetamine, which is wicked cool that number one, you got to do that as an undergrad, but number two, you're still using mm -hmm. that kind of method now. If you could explain how that is analytical chemistry and if that is representative of analytical chemistry, just to give people a sense of the, the depth and breadth of chemistry in general. You know, analytical at the very most basic, I describe it as it's the chemistry of measuring chemicals and stuff whatever that stuff is. So, you know, if you want to know how much caffeine is in your soda, what you do to measure that is analytical chemistry. So we are very focused on trying to both like figure out what are the compounds in something and how much of it is there. And that is like so applicable to almost every industry, which is one of the fun things about analytical chemistry is it's not, you know, you're not focusing on just one industry. You can focus on, you know, pharmaceuticals, food industry, food and beverage is a big place where they hire 
analytical chemist, um, environmental, which is how I got into it. Anywhere where you need to make measurements, figure out or identify compounds, um, an analytical chemist was behind making that method and analytical chemists are behind, you know, creating better methods, uh, more sensitive methods. You can measure lower um, levels of compounds, new compounds that come up. You think of all these new contaminants, PFAS, all that that's out there. Um, there has to be a way to detect it. And that's what an analytical chemist's job is, is to figure out how to do that, how to make those methods. There's confusion, I definitely think, in the industry about, in the field about an analytical chemist versus a chemical technician. I get that question, or sometimes I get pushback from other chemists about, well, isn't that just a, te- aren't you teaching them to be technicians? You're not teaching them to really be chemists. And there's a distinction there. A technician uses the methods that analytical chemists have created and validated to measure compounds. So if you're using, say, something as simple as a conductivity meter, a pH meter, that was developed by an analytical chemist and now is used by many people, technicians and, and lab techs to measure those components. But this that development and that validation, that is what an analytical chemist does. So it seems to me that an analytical chemist figures out the ways that they and other chemists can further explore the world. Oh, that's beautifully put. Yes. It sounds like some of it is method for method's sake, but some of it also is because you just don't know and how are you going to figure it out? Right. I know your graduate work, and, and feel free to talk about this if you want, your graduate work was looking at pollution in the Hudson River, which for those of us who grew up upstate, uh, what feels like ever present and never entirely going to go away. And that is a whole other, that's millions of books are out there. It feels like about the Hudson River cleanup and, and lack thereof which is exactly what you wanted to do, but different than what you're doing now. So I would love to know the transition. First of all, I would love to know what you thought of working in the field of with the PCBs in the Hudson River, which has literally been going on longer than both of our lives, I think. And then the transition you've done at, at the University of Southern Maine with your main focus of work, which we will get into. Yeah, I so in graduate school, yeah, looking at those PCBs, I also looked at a newer compound called polybrominated diphenyl ethers. They're flame retardants still being used today. Some of them, some of them have been phased out. And, you know, it was really interesting looking at those compounds. They, I could talk all day about PCBs and the story of the Hudson River, which is, I think, fascinating. It's very much a cautionary tale of, you know, measuring and, and knowing what is in the sediments and soils before you take action on a, removing a dam or other things. So you don't create a 200 mile super fun site. But the other thing is that it's, it's a cautionary tale, I think. And I, I share this is like PCBs have a structure that we now know that structure with those, com- those atoms on it, those elements is toxic to human life and aquatic life. But then this, the other compound I was looking at that was made well after PCBs was banned looks structurally almost identical. Instead of chlorines, it has bromines. It does have a little oxygen bridge between them, but nobody's surprised to find out that in the environment, it behaves the same way. In our bodies, it behaves very similar, you know? And so it was just always shocking to me that this happens and it happens over and over again with the compounds in our environment. And so that, that really, that drove some of my passion, but also just kind of made me a little frustrated in the field and when I moved up here to Maine, um, at RP, I had all of these resources. My re- my advisor had been working on the Hudson River since they started detecting PCBs in the Hudson. So he had quite a robust um, plan there. And then when I came here and I was starting fresh um, with my own research projects, I worked in an environmental field for a while doing research and did some really cool stuff on street dust and contamination. Uh, but it had a hard time, I think, really finding a a project that was long lasting that could really make an impact. A lot of people are doing environmental work in this area, which is great. And they're doing really great work. And I was looking for a different example for my students. There's tons of examples out there of analytical chemistry in the environment and chemistry alone in the environment. But it's used in so many other fields. And so I went on a tour of Allagash brewery with some of my upper level students that we had lab and just trying to show them other areas. We had also gone to Texas Instruments and a few other places. And 
while we were there, I got talking to Zach Boda, who's our quality manager, and he was like, hey, I wish we had a spectrophotometer at that time so we could measure color. I wish an ID is. I wish we had an ion chromatograph. I wish we had this. I wish it. And those were all the instruments at the time I wanted my students to be learning how to use. And so we created some projects from there. And, and then I realized that other breweries were running into exactly the same problems with not having this access to the equipment and the testing and the, also the sort of the knowledge of how knowing this information about their beer helps them. So that really kind of inspired me to move outside of the environment and into brewing because the methods that we use are really similar. So it wasn't a hard move over there. I didn't need any new, really new instrumentation, but um, it was just a cool twist on what we had been learning. And it coincided almost spectacularly with the rise of microbrewing in Maine, of all sizes, I mean, Allagash is, is one of the, my understanding, is one of the larger <laughs> breweries in Maine, mm-hmm. right by far, still yeah. minuscule compared to gigantic breweries, you know, that people have heard about that have a nationwide reach. So I'm going to force our listeners to have a quick chemistry lesson. If you could explain <laughs> possibly as briefly or as succinctly as possible, the instruments and what they measure and why that's important for brewing and then really putting you out on a limb here, the price tag and why small breweries wouldn't have either the monetary resources or possibly the the personnel resources to do this type of testing. And then we'll connect the dots at the end of that about all the different ways that you're helping your students in the craft brewing industry. Piece of cake. Sure. Absolutely. Easy. Um, yeah, we have a, We're very fortunate in our lab. We've got a ton of really cool equipment that we use. So starting out at a brewery, if you're looking for equipment past sort of the basic pH meter, um, hydrometer that, you know, everybody hopefully has in their brewery, the next step you probably want to take is a spectrophotometer. That's going to measure IBU, so bitterness and color. And those probably run anywhere between $5,000 and $9,000 depending on the bells and whistles that you get, but for one that's really going to do a good job. Moving on up, there's uh, what we call our alkalizer. And this is, this is much more sensitive and um, precise and, and accurate than a hydrometer is. So a hydrometer, you're just plopping this little piece of glass with a weight on it into your beer that's been calibrated. Uh, and it's using density to give you an estimate of your, your alcohol percentage. Um, We have a very high tech density meter on our alkalizer that measures alcohol percentage and specific gravity and other parameters that brewers need to know about their beer, um, especially alcohol or ABV, because that's one of the the state and federally regulated values um, that needs to be on the can and and bottle. So that runs about $40,000, so pretty big price jump. Uh, And that's probably where we start to really have the, the issue for small craft brewers to be able to afford equipment. There are handheld units of those that are in the tens of thousands that people can use, but they don't have the accuracy that ours does. And then we move on up to my favorite, the chromatography equipment. Those are, I mean, now we're in the, you know, anywhere from 30 to $100,000. And those are really now taking a trained, at least technician to be able to run. They've got a lot of upkeep, but what they can do for you is they can measure specific compounds. So the other instruments we're talking about are are more um, sort of groups of chemicals that they're measuring. So like IVU is measuring all of the compounds that contribute to bitterness. On something like chromatography, the, the specialty of it is that you can separate compounds out. So you can look individually at the sugars, the glucose, the maltose, the fructose, all the sugars that are in your beer. You can look specifically at all the flavor compounds. And there's hundreds of those and get an idea of the concentration. So they're really powerful pieces of equipment. But, you know, I don't know of any brewery in the state of Maine that has chromatography equipment yet. So I do remember doing chromatography and just being totally blown away by being able to identify compounds. It, I mean, it was it was really fun and cool. I think I liked it because not the process, but finding out what was in there was just so cool. Yeah. Um, it's cool. You're the, you're the first person. When you read that chromatograph, 
you're the, you're the only person in the whole world who knows what's in that sample at that moment, which I just think is pretty cool. Why? And, and I don't know if you know this exactly. Why is the percent alcohol and that stuff required by the different regulations? And what, what do breweries do if they're just these little small places? Do they just estimate? So they, they can use their hydrometers, um, and estimate. And a lot of times hydrometers do a really good job of getting you close to the value that you need. But I think the regulations are you need to be within plus or minus 0.3% of the actual value that you put on your can. And don't quote me on that. I think, I think that's what it is. It's close to that. We do work with a lot of small breweries. Um, a lot of times it, you know, most of the times nobody's checking. So, you know, but the, the hard part would be if somebody did come along and check and you're off spec, um, then there's some, some issues that will come up. Why they have that regulation, I, I have no idea. That's probably the reason why I ended up going into environmental chemistry and not, uh, environmental law. Yeah, <laughs> I realized after I asked that. I realized um, it may not have I, been the fairest question. Um, no. So you fell into this by helping out Allagash and trying to find a match for your students, which is really cool. And the the one thing we I realized we haven't actually really said is the QC2 lab, which is an actual entity that you have established that is well beyond a quick conversation with Allagash and a few students of, well, why don't we try and learn this? So this is an opportune time for you to explain the QC2 lab and what I would call a really fantastic and extensive relationship with brewers in Maine. And I'm just going to stop and hand you the baton and let you go. The QC2 lab uh, is a lab at the University of Southern Maine that we're dedicated to testing and education for brewers and doing undergraduate research in the brewing industry. It came quickly after that conversation with Alec Ash. That was like the start of the idea, sort of um, the seed that kind of got it all going. And then just a year after that, I had a conversation with Rising Tide um, with Heather Sanborn and Nathan Sanborn over there and Sean Sullivan on the Maine Brewers Guild. And at that time, Heather was the president of the, the Brewers Guild. And, and Heather's also really invested in education and um, the state of Maine. And so understanding Rising Tide's need, and they weren't even the smallest brewery at the time, and, and we're growing quite quickly. And Allagash's need, we realized like this is a need of all of the brewers in the state of Maine to really help create a, you know, a place where they can test quality, where we can educate them on how to test their beers, both in house and then why you would want to choose a third party to test some of these parameters. And also at that time, like you said, it, it's exploded since we started in 2016. And at that time, you know, and we still are talking about Maine being, a, you know, we're a destination now for craft beer. Um, and we were growing into that when we started the lab. And that quality is at the heart of us being that. Because if you don't have quality beer, nobody's going to come to you um, again, at least. And so those conversations started. And we were fortunate enough that the Maine Economic Improvement Funds were excited to fund the lab. I was looking to start small, just with that alkalizer I told you about. That was kind of the addition to my research program that I needed. And they told me to dream big. So somewhere between, I started with 40,000. I ended up with half a million over three years. And we were really able to create this space that is, we call it a quality control collaboratory. That's the QC2 part of it, where we can, the laboratory part, right? But also collaborate with those breweries. And have them have a space where they can learn and get their beer tested. I think one of the hard parts, and this is probably where the education really drove this, is that brewers, you know, a lot of brewers don't have a science background. Um, but there's, I mean, there's so much science in what's going on in brewing beer. I think that's, to me, I mean, I, I love a good craft beer. I am just fascinated by the science of making that craft beer. Um, there's so much that goes into it. And so there's a million places to do research. There's so many unanswered questions in there. But brewers, a lot of them don't have that science background. And so asking them then to learn how to use a microscope to count their yeast, to understand how to detect lactobacillus and pediococcus as a contaminant by creating this media and having to grow it in there. Like that sounds 
crazy. That sounds like an impossible feat because they've never used done any of that before. But it's not. They're very simple pieces, but you, they need that education and that help to get there. Um, and then understanding, you know, kind of what the lab can offer. So that was the driving force for it. And now we we serve, you know, last count was 85 different breweries we've worked with um, in the testing lab. We've got research projects with at least three or four different breweries that are, are going on right now. And it's been a lot of fun. And all the cool thing is also all of the things that we're doing is supported by our students. So all of the testing that we do is really done by our students. We train them, our lab coordinator, Sam and I. But then the students get this opportunity to apply what they've learned in classes uh, within this testing lab. So they're, they're asking as lab technicians in that side of it to real world samples, giving data that really is important to these, this industry. And then they get to move on from there and do research. Um, and that's where they get to start using more of the chromatography and the higher end equipment and really investigating what's in this beer. And, and right now we're focusing on non-alcoholic beers. So kind of what makes those different chemically than their alcoholic counterparts. And that's been a lot of fun. And there's a lot of things that we do. I think one of the misconceptions about the QC2 lab is we're, we're not a program. We're not, there's no classes these students take. This is an experience that's outside of the classroom for them. Um, it's really more of like a, this little business within the university that's running. That's, Sounds like, I mean, it's a project, do. right? It's a really cool project yeah. that relies on the education that the students are getting in a wide variety of classes, but bringing it all together under one umbrella. That's what it sounds like. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. So I have a couple of, of questions. The first one was, do you know, I feel like I'm putting you on the spot like the law thing, but I don't mean to. Um, do you know, if there's other states that have this kind of collaboration with their brewing guilds and a super enthusiastic academic partner who wants to give their students an opportunity? There are some really amazing graduate programs out there that do research with breweries in their state. And um, so, but that's graduate programs, so they're very different. There's some interesting, so there's some very small undergraduate pockets out there that there's like a faculty member doing research who gets their students engaged in one project um, or two. I don't, I don't know of any pro- program like ours that is this sort of testing lab in a university that is giving students sort of this broader experience of being able to come in and test and learn the ropes there and then do undergraduate research that is ongoing and continually supporting such a large part of the industry up here. So I think we're one of a kind. I can't think of any either, but I didn't want to just state that outright. Um, any longtime listener or a person who has had to endure my cheerleading for Maine science is going to know that my, you know, the leading question part of this is Maine really is a leader in this and it's, it's wicked cool on so many levels. <laughs> and I just wanted to make yeah. sure that uh, I wasn't reading that wrong. My other question is, you know, you've got these undergrads who are, Learning really cool techniques that you you said a couple of times can be applied in a, in a wide array of areas. I'm wondering how many of them stick with it and and stick with specifically beer, but also possibly other food and beverage. And then maybe maybe this is where they get their passion and switch to environmental stuff. Do you have any sense of mm. of what what comes next? And I know you've only just you know you really haven't been doing this for that long. It feels like to me you've been around forever, but. What you've accomplished in five years is pretty extraordinary. What do students do when they're, what do they get inspired to do after they, they do this? They, you know, our students, we have a couple of students who have gone into the industry, the brewing industry. And that's really exciting to see. And it's fun to work with them now as professionals and, and connect with them. Um, but that's not the majority of the students that work in the lab. Yeah, like we said before, a lot of these things that they're learning are so transferable to pharmaceuticals, forensics, environmental, that it's it's helping them have those lab skills. And I know from talking with local industries who have hired our students in either sort of the biotech industries and the analytical testing that the skills our students are learning in the lab are so helpful for them when they start up these jobs. Less training has to be done. They've got they're just ready to go. So, so I've seen them move into the biotech industry and some of the testing labs locally. And then I, you know, they're also going to graduate schools out there. 
definitely is not, you know, sort of narrowing the field for what they're studying. It definitely is just helping them get some skills and then letting them go where they want to. So what do you think the next steps are for the QC2 lab, if anything? Do you want to expand beyond partnering with the Brewers Guild and to other food places? Do you want to head back to the environmental field? I don't know that you need another mission. Your plate is plenty full. (laughs) I'm just curious. I would imagine I'm not the first person that has asked you this question. Uh, That's the cool thing about the lab. There's always new places to grow and things to do. I definitely see this as the sort of my home base for research now. Um, So environmental will always be a a really cool passion, something I teach my students about, um, but not something that I'll do for research probably. Yeah, there's so many things. I think, you know, some of the research projects that are out there right now, there's always new ones to to go after. The lab is now bringing on a new alkalizer that has more capabilities so we can work with the spirits industry, um, with wineries. Um, we've also done some with kombucha, you know, so I definitely want to stay in the fermented world. Um, I like that. Um, I like to be there once you get into food broader sense it's a little bit more scary with some of the microbes that are out there we we do do pcr in our lab and look for a micro contamination but what i like about alcoholic beverages there's nothing in there that's gonna kill you or really hurt you at all so yeah that's a good way (laughs) that's a (laughs) an excellent way to think about that is coffee something that you could expand into as as a fermented area and because that strikes me as another place where there's this undercurrent growing in Maine of different coffee roasters and and different focuses for coffee. Yeah, it is. It's a place I guess we could. I haven't. It's not a industry I've looked into much uh, into because we've been so busy with the brewers um, lately. But I do think if we if we settle down with them, that's an industry we can definitely look into. All I do, I feel like, is put you on the spot. And this this is a much more aggressive <laughs> interview than what I've actually done. Uh, do you have advice that you give students beyond just, you know, general chemistry isn't all that, but just kind of finding their place in the world of science? Oh, boy. Yeah. So much advice to be given <laughs> to our students. I, You know, I think starting them off seeing that, well, that chemistry is, something that needs to be practiced to be learned. You know, I I think that there's this misconception. I think it happens with math. I think it happens with chemistry. Those two, I guess, really specifically that, you know, you're either born to do it or you're not. And it's not, that's not how it goes for most people. It's, it's practicing. It's like a sport, you know, and I tell my students, you're not going to, you're not going to be able to do this if you just read the book. It's, you know, you you were not going to go play baseball if you just read a book got to you got to put the time in and practice it and and learn those skills and and get time in the lab and learn those skills. So I think that's a piece of advice I give my students and and also you know a lot of them worry they don't know what they want to do yet and and sort of that's the beauty of chemistry too. There's so many different places you can go with it and biochemistry and not knowing it is totally okay. You can you can try out different things especially in undergrad and find your path. You don't need to know it right off the bat. The other thing I would tell students, especially ones who aren't chemistry majors, is that some of the things that they're passionate about, actually, if they if they understood chemistry better, or sometimes major than that, it would give them a much better understanding of what's going on. And so not to be afraid of looking at that major if you're really interested in how the world works. I feel like um, I've just cheerleaded chemistry for most of this conversation, which was is nice because <laughs> it's been so long since I've thought about Go chemistry. Uh, what I learned. I I love chemistry. I really did. It's what got me into science. And I, for a long time, I felt almost like a, a failure is too strong of a word. Like I was somehow not doing it right because I wasn't in the lab. And then I, you know, as I got older and theoretically smarter, I realized that chemistry is what allowed me to do all this other really great stuff that I really, I really enjoy doing, right? Policy work and understanding mm-hmm. the world around me and all of that. So Chemistry really is a bedrock foundation of understanding the world around you. <laughs> I think this has been a really fantastic conversation. I appreciate you letting me ask the advice you give your students. You have been so forthright talking about how much you've wanted to give an education to your students that's applied and, and they can see the end result, which is really fantastic and one of the harder things to do with chemistry, I think, because 
you can't see the molecules right in front of you unless you can visualize it. So to actually see these, you know, to do these tools and to, to see it happen, I think is, is a huge opportunity for aha moments for students. So I really do appreciate that. And I appreciate the stuff that you're doing with, with beer and lab and getting brewers on board for understanding just a little bit more of the science and the magic that happens in their glass beyond the taste, which is also fantastic. So thank you. Thank you for having me on this podcast. This has been really fun. I love the work you're doing with it. It's really cool. Thanks for listening to the Maine Science Podcast. Make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing on your podcast platform of choice. And please leave a rating and review. It will help more people find us and help spread the word about some of the remarkable people doing science in Maine. The Maine Science Podcast is recorded at Discovery Studios at the Maine Discovery Museum in Bangor, Maine. The Maine Science Podcast is produced and edited by me, Kate Dickerson. We receive financial support from Central Maine Power, production support from Miranda Bouchard, and social media support from Next Media. The Discover Maine theme was composed and performed by Nick Parker.